Portfolio Builder members, today is December 4th, and a anonymous source from Bloomberg, uh, or a, a Bloomberg report from an anonymous source says that the trade deal is back on track. Stock market gained uh, $4 uh, from yesterday through today. Quite remarkable, a very abnormal move. We were sitting on a maximum profit on today's trade, and it ended up with a three cent loss per share, so nothing uh, too harmful. Uh, but we're back to this narrative that the trade deal is back on track. I don't believe it for a second, but we'll review our strategy and how we play the market safely until we do get to a conclusion on this trade deal. Just remember, December 15th is when the tariffs will hit at this current point in time. Uh, so let's take a look at today's trade alert. We're selling a at the money call option for a huge credit, a dollar twenty-nine. So we're ten cents underneath the current trading price. So we're picking up about a dollar ten on the potential profit, maximum profit while we own the spy. So if the spy were to skyrocket here to three fifteen today, we might end up in a position where we're assigned, and we would walk away on the long side of the trade uh, with a profit of about a dollar ten. Now, if the SPY were to travel significantly higher, the value of our downside protection that 310 put would potentially lose value. So our net profit uh, in this case is fifty dollars per contract. In our portfolio we have 19 contracts. That's nine hundred fifty dollar profit potential between now and Friday. Now you will note that there is some downside risk of $100 per contract if the trade war were to re-escalate and the SPY were to sell off. Now we're perfectly okay with that and in fact I would love for the stock market to sell off because we're long the bond market which had a huge profit yesterday and it gave it back today. It's been going back and forth every other day, uh, Monday, Tuesday and now Wednesday. The TLT has been a huge profit down to a little bit of a loss, back to a huge profit, back to a little loss. Uh, so we're getting this conflicting information about the trade war, uh, which is giving the TLT this volatility. Uh, but the bottom line is if the SPY sells off, we're going to make out like a bandit on the TLT and GDX, and we're betting down on emerging markets currently. Now remember, yesterday markets were in a tailspin. They're talking about delaying the tariffs till after the election. And we'll look at some funny tweets. A little Chinese guy uh, said, I, I predict, this was hours before the market would open, I predict that a top U.S. official will say the trade tax are back on track this morning to try to buoy up the U.S. stock market. And sure enough, we had Trump saying uh, trade talks are going great after just yesterday saying we may not even do trade talks. So I'm calling bullshit in terms of betting uh, up in equities and down in bonds. So we're currently pointing up on the SPY trade and up in the bond market. So it makes it hard for us to lose. And uh, in this setup, what could potentially happen is the SPY rockets higher today, which I don't think it will. Uh, but if it did, you may find yourself assigned, which is great news. That means you're going to capture the maximum profit on the long side of this trade and be in cash tomorrow. You won't know if you've been assigned until the next morning, but in our program we would love to get assigned because what could potentially happen is the market jumps up today, we're assigned tomorrow, and then you're long, you're put. So if we were able to get assigned today, hit the maximum profit on the long side of this trade tomorrow, and then potentially be long a put plus be long the TLT for some bad news into Friday, we could really do well. Now in this setup, again, we only need the SPY to stay where it is or travel higher to get the maximum profit in this trade. And we have a little bit of wiggle room to not lose money if it just trades lower slightly. So this is a uh, trade alert that can generate profits in multiple directions. But the big idea on this trade, now let me zoom this in, is that we were able to finance downside protection absolutely free. Now how are we doing this? We sold the 311.50 call option for $1.25.
And right now it's trading at exactly 311.52. So we have uh, built into this assignment a two cent loss on the underlying. So the, the value of the SPY right now is 311.54. We're telling the option buyer, we'll sell you our shares for 311.50. So that's three cents less than it's worth. However, the option buyer is paying a huge premium of $1.25 a share to have that right. So the option buyer thinks between now and Friday, the SPY is going to uh, travel to 312.75 at a very minimum just for him to break even. And after that, they can start generating profits. So who likes to do that? Stock speculators, folks who just don't have enough money to purchase 100 shares of the SPY. So I love to own 100 sh shares of the SPY and then take advantage of selling that call option because we can use that money to generate profits in any market environment. Now, right now, as you can see, I'm highly skeptical that a trade deal will be finalized by December 15th. I think in the best case, they say, you know what? We're still talking. We haven't broken down the talks. We're still arguing about how many tariffs to roll back, what price the Chinese are gonna pay for agricultural, uh, purchases and how much they're going to purchase as well as what we will do if they fail to meet their obligation. So I think the best case right now is that they say, you know what, we're not going to spoil Christmas. Well, let's push this tariff hike into January and just keep the dialogue going into January. So that I think is the most likely best outcome uh, for the trade talks. And if that happens, I think we go right back to that 315 level that I predicted quite some time ago, and we'll go look at that trade alert. Uh, but it's just funny that we literally touched with the very tip of our fingertip 315 on the SPY, and then we immediately started seeing the trade escalate. Uh, now, the market is very, very sensitive to any negative news on the trade talks. You saw just the talk that maybe we won't get a trade deal this year or after the election the SPY quickly sold off from 315 to 307 in several days. So that was an $8 loss per share. That's a big potential loss. That's why with this trade setup, we can be rest assured if anything goes negative in the trade talks between now and Friday, well, we've seen it. The SPY could easily go back to that 307 level at a minimum. That means most investors right now, between now and Friday, on the equity side of their portfolio, have the potential to lose anywhere from 1% to 2% of their total portfolio easily, just on a tiny negative comment about the trade war. In our portfolio, we will not lose more than $0.98 cents a share on the SPY, or about 0.3% of the value of the SPY. So it's an ultra safe, very conservative option trade where if we see the SPY travel considerably higher, oh well, we're missing out on some of those profits. Uh, but on the other hand, if any negative news comes out whatsoever, then we are completely protected to the downside by being long the 310 put. So literally North Korea could start firing some nuclear missiles which, by the way, they're back to firing missiles left and right now. They're getting very anxious to get all these sanctions off their country. And uh, so tensions are mounting. We've got the impeachment uh, going full throttle right now. Most likely we'll see uh, articles of impeachment being drawn up by before Christmas and headed into the Senate into January. Uh, so there's a lot of risks in the market. That's why we want to play it a little bit more... Uh, conservatively rather than being uh, kind of like the sheep walking off the cliff uh, hoping that everything's just going to work itself out. And meanwhile, China knows that Trump's in a tough position, so I don't think they're going to give him an easy win. In fact, uh, all the media from China has been stating that in order for uh, any trade deal to be completed, they want all tariffs rolled back. That would look that would look extremely weak. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, so, all right, so that's our trade alert today. Let me pull up the trade doc so we can take a look at it. Okay, so back on the 28th, we predicted 315 SPY. 
Uh, and this was back when the SPY was much lower, uh, below 290. So we had a 25 point move on the SPY. And we've been racking up profits on the SPY left and right from this. Now I do want to note that we made a lot less than $25 uh, because we were protecting the position at all times. My thought process is that this trade deal could break down at any point in time. And when it does, we've seen pullbacks in the S&P 500 that are lasting anywhere from a month to three months just in the past calendar year and resulting in losses between 6 and 16%. So we've really had three big volatility quakes in the S&P 500. And it's been, uh, it's been quite some time since the last volatility quake. We had a little bit of a spike in the VIX this week. Not much. I don't think the trimmers are over. So we've always had complete protection to the downside while hitting these first base wins over and over and over again on the SPY. So if you do go to your trade alert email, highly recommend you go back through time. You can look at each of these trade alerts and see that we've had substantial wins uh, with very limited losses over the past few months while we uh, see what comes out of this trade deal. Um, to review our open positions, our emerging market position is down 15 cents a share after yesterday. We have until next Tuesday. Uh, there's more and more banks having uh, problems in China. So they're coming out saying that the, the worst is over for China, all is well. But meanwhile, banks are failing uh, and they're not increasing their money supply. So they're, it looks like they're actually dr deliberately trying to slow down their economy to create a recession in the US and try to get Trump out of office. Um, TLT went from a big loss on Monday to a big win on Tuesday, back down to a loss on today's uh, open position, but we have until tomorrow. And I will remain long the TLT until the federal fund rate gets near zero. So that's really the big picture on the TLT. If you forget about the trade war altogether, you just look at deficits and you look at uh, the, the, the big bond bubble we're in, it's either the central banks allow the bond bubble to burst and all governments become unfunded and the cost of borrowing money for governments goes up to somewhere around 5 to 10%, uh, or they can delay the pain and drop these rates towards zero. So we're at 1.5 to 1.75. We have the next federal fund meeting uh, announcement on rate changes coming out in just seven days. And my expectation uh, is that potentially they stay flat this month and in February go for the next 25 basis point cut. So the big picture is rates are going lower, the global slowdown is real, and it's slowly working its way into US figures even today. So we have market jumping up on bad economic data, which we'll look at today. Um, so it's, it's a very highly manipulated market. Also, surprisingly, gold didn't sell off all that much and still is in a profit. Now, we're not playing spot gold. We're playing gold miners. A lot more money to be made in the gold miners versus spot gold, uh, especially for smaller account sizes, uh, which typically in our program are between half a million and $2 million. Now, I know for your average Joe listening to this, that may sound like a lot of money uh, if you're in the $100,000 to $500,000 range. Uh, but the players who are betting on spot gold are really trillion dollar portfolios and central banks. All your best hedge funds like Stanley, Drunken Miller, etc. are loading up on the top positions in GDX. Okay, so let's take a look at how to close out last trade alert. You had to buy to close your 311 call, which was at a maximum profit this morning until it rallied on this hope of potentially maybe a rate cut from the Fed. We got massive quantitative easing going on, so the banks have fresh ammo. Uh, we did bail out the banks again, just like in 2008, uh, by buying all their bonds off their portfolio. Currently, we're at $320 billion that the central bank has printed and handed over to the banks to buy their treasuries at a massive profit. We're talking 20% profit on these bonds that they've been accumulating over the last year as the U.S. government goes into the biggest deficit in its history in 2019. So without the central bank 
uh, purchasing these bonds, yields would be spiking. The government would not be able to create these deficits. And with yield spiking, stocks would uh, crash because money would want to grab that 3, 4, 5% yield on a 10, 20, 30 year treasury. Instead, we have a distorted market where the central bank uh, is bailing out the banks. They're making massive profits, uh, loaning money to the government. And so this trend is continuing and that's why we want to be long stocks and bonds uh, in general. Uh, despite all the chaos, the global slowdown, um, and the trade war. Now it's only when I get a catalyst, a very vicious catalyst, that I will short term short the stock market while rates are so low. So we'll take a big look. Uh, we'll take a look at the big picture in a minute. And again, here's the new trade alert. If you did not take Monday's trade, you can skip step one and go straight to step two. And until we get an outcome in the trade war, I'll be most likely doing very, very conservative spy trades because I know there's a huge downside risk, at least in terms of short-term volatility in the S&P 500. On the TLT, I'm much less worried about the long-term outcome of where the TLT heads. The only way the TLT really has trouble is if the central bank stops buying bonds, which is what they are allowed to purchase, not stocks. And right now they're purchasing bonds at a record pace, faster than QE1, 2, 3, or 4. We've never purchased bonds uh, from the central bank at this speed ever in history. So that's our current trade alert. Let's take a look at the top news that hit the markets over the past 24 hours. And uh, good afternoon, Ron. Thanks for saying hello in the chat. If you're listening live, make sure to say hi in the chat so we can see who's on and give you a shout out. Okay, uh, this is from the communist Twitter handle. I predict there's a high probability that President Trump or a senior U.S. official will openly say in a few hours that China-U.S. trade talks have made a big progress in order to pump up the U.S. stock markets. They've been doing this a lot. Okay, here's that futures move this morning uh, from Bloomberg. An anonymous source says the trade deal is back on track. What a joke. My sources here say China thought it had agreement in principle on tariff rollback in early November, but President Trump backed away from it. So unclear how close two sides really are. U.S.-China moved closer to trade deal despite harsh rhetoric. Secretary Wilbur Ross, several things still need to close trade deal with China, including details on products, quantities to be purchased by China. Agreeing on a trade deal by this December or next December is much less important than getting a proper deal. Another tweet about Ross, China's Huawei is urging its suppliers to move overseas to avoid U.S. sanctions in violation of U.S. law. China and the U.S. are moving closer to agreeing on the amount of tariffs to be rolled back in a phase one trade deal. Bloomberg reported on Wednesday, citing sources, China Foreign Ministry, the U.S. will pay the price over the Hong Kong and Xinjiang bills. On the time frame for a trade deal with the U.S., China Foreign Ministry says Beijing won't set a timeline or deadline. This is after real Donald Trump suggested the deal might not come until after the 2020 election. China's bond market saw six defaults in two days as the country is hurtling toward another record year of corporate bond defaults. So this is the news propping emerging markets up today. And we'll look at a ADP report, which was the worst since 2010. Uh, U.S. President Trump said on Wednesday that trade talks with China are going very well, and we'll see what happens. He said on Tuesday, that's yesterday, that a trade deal might have to wait until after 2020 U.S. presidential election. That's probably the most likely truth. Global Times, the current government governance in Xinjiang is very effective. The U.S. simply cannot win this Xinjiang fight. China holds all the leverage in Xinjiang. Zhang and the U.S. has zero actual tools at its disposal. This is where they have Muslims 
uh, in these re-education camps. Meanwhile, where markets are trusting this Bloomberg source about uh, progress with China, but here's another uh, news clip about Bloomberg. So first of all, uh, Bloomberg came out and banned uh, any negative pieces about any Democrat. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, the uh, Trump responded by banning his news organization from all White House press meetings. Uh, and then this just come out. Uh, Bloomberg editor quits over China's story. Bloomberg news editor Ben Richardson has quit the organization in protest of the editor's handling of an investigative piece on China. I left Bloomberg because of the way the story was mishandled and because of how the company made misleading statements in the global press and senior executives disparaged the team that worked so hard to execute an incredibly de demanding story. The story in question was written by reporter Michael Forsyth, who left Bloomberg for the New York Times after anonymous Bloomberg employees revealed that top editors did not publish the investigative article on Chinese elites due to fears that Bloomberg would be expelled from the country. Bloomberg relies heavily on sales of its financial data terminals in the country. Ah, so who would China rather win the 2020 election? Joe Biden, whose son took billions in hedge fund capital to go purchase American companies and transfer the IP back to China. Bloomberg, who has billions of dollars uh, from China, uh, or Donald Trump. There have been four truces in the two years of the U.S.-China trade war. Here's how long the ceasefires announced on the blow dates have lasted. May 20th, we had a nine-day break. December 1st, 2018, 155-day break. June 29th, 17 days. October 11th, the current break, 53 days. China Foreign Ministry will not set any timeline or deadline for a trade deal. Uh, now, China's had all sorts of manufacturing numbers come out uh, positive, although it's very um, questionable when we're seeing so many uh, different major companies go bankrupt in China and default on their bonds. Uh, and they're also not increasing their money supply. So I'm going to call BS on that. Once the motion is finally approved, it means the U.S. has entered a new phase in interfering in China's Xinjiang affairs. China should impose sanctions on U.S. politicians who push the act. So China has this technology that's way ahead of the U.S. in terms of being able to scan crowds with video cameras. And their goal is to have two cameras per citizen within the next 10 years. They already have millions of cameras all over China. But they can uh, read your face and they're identifying who they believe are part of this race, this Muslim race, who are known to rebel against the Chinese uh, party, the Communist Party. And so it prints out lists of tens of thousands of people who they then go send out the police to round up and move into these concentration camps. It's a it's an extremely outrageous affair, and I think we're going to see this come to light as we get closer and closer to the election. U.S. House passes bill demanding sanctions on senior Chinese officials over the treatment of Uyghur Muslims. The bill is a paper tiger with no special leverage that could affect Xinjiang. Xinjiang officials, including the party chief, Chen Guanguo will look at sanction with scorn because they have no connection with the U.S., but U.S. politicians with stakes in China should be careful. Meanwhile, U.S. ADP employment change uh, dropped. Now, we've had record employment growth, uh, but at some point, you run out of people to hire. If you do listen to the business uh, forums with the Fed, with Powell, uh, the only thing they complain about is not being able to find cheap labor. So I do suspect we're going to see wages slowly grow and that uh, unemployment growth should slow down. That's not necessarily the end of the world, uh, but this is a huge miss on the estimated 140,000 jobs that were anticipated. Now, the other bad news is most of the jobs that have been picked up are low-paying uh, server jobs. Uh, here's some forward-looking 
predictions on the jobs market. So it is expected to slow down, uh, just like we saw in today's print. We're seeing retail sales slow down in Hong Kong, U.S., London. Uh, perfect storm Trump administration to cut 750,000 from food stamps ahead of a recession. On the same note, there's a viral clip about Bloomberg that's been spreading uh, from two years ago where he told uh, the interviewer that he believes we should tax poor people to try to uh, manipulate them to have a healthier lifestyle. And he was talking about taxing sugar, cigarettes, things of that nature. In fact, we have a Jeffrey Gunlack quote uh, joking about that in a little bit. Apparently, all the leaders were laughing at poor Donald Trump, and he rushed home uh, without a press conference. Just finished meetings with Turkey and Germany, heading to a meeting now with those countries that have met their 2% goals in terms of funding NATO. Um, angry Trump cancels press leaves NATO summit early after video of world leaders laughing at him is a released uh, on the impeachment front doesn't matter what the democrats write four facts will never change the call transcript shows no linkage president trump and president Zelensky both say no pressure ukraine didn't know aid was held up at the time of the call and ukraine never took any action to get the aid released i think the big picture on this is that the trump team was investigating illegal activities of joe biden and other democrats that go way before this call and as a defense measure, the Democrats are saying, hey, you broke the law uh, by trying to investigate us and use political leverage to gain uh, this information. So it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see if this really does go to a vote. Uh, the rumor is that it will go to a vote almost surefire uh, before Christmas and then head to the Senate in January, uh, which is interesting because there's a lot... Uh, once it goes to the Senate, we'll get more of a real trial. Um, okay, Jeffrey Gunlack. Warren rolled out the Fair Work Week proposal, a try to glue part-time workers to her coalition. Panic move of irrelevant incremental thinking. So this new proposal, proposal from Warren is that we will uh, make employers have the part-time workers have a set schedule that's never changed without two weeks' notice. Now, of course, that's going to uh, cause layoffs and not help these folks. Uh, but another piece from Warren, she's been losing popularity quickly. Joe Biden still remains in the top of the polls, which is surprising to me because I haven't seen any anything from him where he can actually say a coherent sentence uh, from all of the Democratic debates, from interviews. Okay, Jeffrey Gunn, like Mike Bloomberg, paraphrasing, tax poor people more regressively to manipulate their lifestyle choices so that they live longer. Oh, boy. Not sure that will get the vote. Look at the charts. Here's a wild move in the S&P 500. We can see with just a little negativity uh, and lack of positive news in the trade deal, we quickly sold off $8 on the SPY. This is 315, the top for 2019. I would not be surprised if that's the case. Uh, here's a bigger look at the SPY touching that 315 level. And we were predicting it right around this crash right here. TLT up and down and up and down. Big picture is TLT will most likely travel another $40 higher uh, simply from the Fed slowly but surely dropping rates to zero. The big picture uh, has nothing to do with the trade war front. Sure, the trade war does cause volatility in the TLT, but the big picture is these massive deficits and these massive debts around the world are untenable. And if interest rates go up, uh, everyone's going to sell their bonds because the yield is too low to hold. So they're all expecting that rates will continue to go lower and that central banks will bail out everyone holding these bonds. And they probably will. Why not? That's what they can do. Emerging markets up today a little bit. Uh, big picture on this is that if we do escalate the trade war and start putting uh, sanctions on emerging markets, cutting off capital flows to emerging markets, and uh, potentially forcing China to actually open up their books, open up their economy, open up their currency exchange rate. This has a lot of downside potential risk.
Now, if we do get a trade one, a phase one trade deal, and we do get a lot of capital flowing into emerging markets, I would also want to bet up on this asset. Uh, so right now we're currently in a tight inverted option caller on emerging markets. We have very little to lose if it travels higher, uh, but if it does tank uh, below, I believe 41 at this point is where we can get our maximum profit on our emerging markets trade. And you can see just back in October, it was as low as 40.27. So we have until Tuesday for that to play out. GDX sold off a little bit, but not much. Gold market is uh, certainly signaling that there's inflation ahead from irresponsible monetary policy. And of course, uh, inflation is what would cause the central banks to supposedly stop lowering rates, although they continually change the formula for what they look at uh, to avoid real estate prices going up, medical costs going up, college costs going up. And so the big picture is the debt levels in 2008 are pathetic compared to the debt levels in 2019. And so as we do uh, slowly work our way into a recession, we will see massive money printing at a greater pace than we did in 2009, uh, which pushed GDX all the way up to 66. So I think that we can go much higher than that uh, during the next recession. And we're already uh, in this period of quantitative easing. There's been more quantitative easing in the last three months than ever before in U.S. history. Now, will they suddenly stop? I don't think so. And they have told us they will continue the $60 billion a month until quarter two of 2020. So that's if everything goes gravy with the trade deal, which I don't think it will. So if the trade deal does escalate, we can expect the Fed will ramp up quantitative easing, uh, increase the repo market size, and cut rates faster, which expedites uh, both the stock and bond bubble popping, which is what I think China wants. Okay, here's the exchange rate of CNH against the dollar. We've seen this is starting to travel higher. Uh, every time this devalues stock market has had a fit shortly after. It did tighten a little bit yesterday. This is our boot camp trade that we're dying to jump into. And the big picture is the Chinese have printed 200 and now 11 trillion won, and, uh, which is the denomination of their currency, the renminbi. And they say seven of their currencies worth one U.S. dollar. But the catch is they don't allow their currency to be freely traded. So they're dramatically overvaluing what their U.N. is worth and slowly selling those to fund as much as they can uh, in terms of buying uh, energy commodities to go build stuff to keep their population busy. So they, they have a deficit with the U.S. of about $500 billion dollars. And lo and behold, guess how much commodities they tend to import uh, with those dollars? $500 billion. Now, meanwhile, their $4 trillion reserve is down 25%. And they also have to fund the Hong Kong uh, exchange, which is a peg against the dollar. Hong Kong has lost 80% of its reserve. So the longer this goes on, uh, the less cash China is going to have. And Kyle Bass has a big piece about the World Bank loaning China a billion dollars as if they were an emerging country and not a mega power. Uh, so the more the U.S. can cut off China from dollars, the more pain they will, uh, they'll be in. Here's the bigger picture of CNH since 2015. It has devalued from six to seven. If you go back to 2010, uh, you'd see that's when they really lost control of their currency, and that's also when they lost control of their GDP. The bottom line is building ghost cities and real estate that no one ever lives in is not a profitable business uh, that can be uh, that can last for a very long time. So they've really been able to primarily do this in the last 10 years, is keep their GDP looking at least positive, uh, but now it's crashing at a very fast pace. And a lot of people are expecting it will be well below six into 2020, uh, which it does seem like they're actually trying to allow to happen to put pressure on the United States. Here's that German bond 
This is a better look at how healthy China is as it's a key trading partner to China. It's in a downward slope. My bet is this goes into severe negative territory into 2020. And this could potentially give the Fed ammo to say, hey, maybe 0% is not the lower bound. If you read their FOMC minutes from the last meeting, it's 18 pages, and they don't talk about raising interest rates once. In fact, uh, all they talk about is how to deal with the bond market getting upset as they approach the effective lower bound in the next recession. Also, every single time the Fed has cut rates three times, uh, 75 basis points in this case. We've had a recession shortly after. They're not dumb. In fact, they're very smart and they've been extremely uh, accurate in terms of being able to predict, predict recessions before they happen. And their response has always been the same. They start to cut rates into the recession. Now, typically they wait for equities to crash 50%. Then they go buy the bonds from the banks the banks make a massive profit on those bonds, and then what do the banks do? They get to go buy up equities at, at a fire sale, sale price. price. Should be a crime, but it's not, so we just gotta understand the mechanics. Now this time around, they can't cut rates uh, like they have in the past. In the past, they'll cut rates 5%. Well, you can't do that when you're starting at two and a half. So they're cutting rates and printing money while we're at all-time highs, trying to avoid a market crash. Here's your 30-year yield on the Treasury. This is what really affects the TLT. And so uh, the lower the German bond goes, we can look at the spread of the U.S. bond from the German bond. You can see they're highly correlated. Germans is just downward sloped, while ours uh, is a little, bit, uh, a little bit more of a flat line. You can see these dips are going to lower lows each time. Uh, so I would certainly say this is one of those dead cat bounces here. Uh, meanwhile, the dollar remains strong. If you go look at just about any uh, minor currency pair, just strip out the euro, strip out the yen, uh, and look at any other currency in the world uh, besides actually Russia. You could pick any country in the world, their currency has lost at least half of its value against the dollar in the last five years. Okay, so if I had a thousand dollars a month of interest payments in the in the debt I have as a country, which is not denominated in my foreign currency, it's denominated in dollars. Well, if I've lost 50% of my country's buying power relative to the currency, now that interest payment is $2,000 a month. Now that's if you're a pretty fiscal responsible country. Most countries are actually losing 90% of their purchasing power. So that means your $1,000 a month interest payment is now costing you $10,000 a month. So you can just see how this problem uh, is like the snowball. It gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, now, the euro has lost maybe 20% of its value in the last several years. Uh, and the yen has been going up and down. Japan's been an experiment of its own. And it has gone into extreme debt. It owns 70% of all its assets. So we'll uh, have to have a whole special just on what happens to a country when it booms and then busts and then fails to raise its interest rates, get rid of the malinvestment, and kind of do a reset. So China's, or Japan's been trying to avoid a reset, and we'll see if the U.S. is going down that same path or not, as well as China. Here's a look at your dollar over a longer time period. Uh, Jim Rogers is predicting that another spike like this is going to occur in the dollar and then that will be the demise of the dollar. Uh, Ray Dalio saying next move is down. Jeffrey Gunlack thinks the next move is down. Uh, so we'll see how this all plays out. And meanwhile, Bitcoin's having a little bit of a bounce. If we got low rates, quantitative easing, and the potential for fear, the potential for citizens that want to get their capital away from their government because of capital controls and devaluation, you want to be long your Bitcoin. So we have a 2% position in our portfolio in that. And as long as this is at elevated prices, that does show you uh, there's still a lot of tensions in the currency markets. Let's take a quick look at our program and how it works, and we'll get you guys out for the day.
Daily income trade alerts at noon Eastern. We trade 100 shares of the SPY Monday, Wednesday, Friday, taking advantage of three option expirations per week. 200 shares of emerging markets on Tuesday, playing China and its trading partners, including India, Russia, South Korea. It does exclude Japan. 200 shares of the TLT traded on Thursday. That's your 20 plus year treasury bond. We're playing rates, not really trying to play the yield from the, the bonds. And then 200 shares of GDX on Thursday. That's your gold miner ETF. Our target income is 1% a month or $750 profit per $75,000 invested. A lot of our followers do have seven figure portfolios to really make this uh, very attractive. Our average return is 1.3% per month over the past 12 months. We've delivered a profit in 11 of 12 months. Largest drawdown is 1% in a single month, and we've never lost capital over a 90-day period. Our portfolio really does well when equities tank. So if you're all in on the stock market, you've had quite a run, maybe it's time to take some profits off the table and allocate capital to our strategy. So when the next downturn does hit, you won't lose a whole bunch of money. In December, when the market crashed 16%, we made 1%. In May, when the market sold off 7%, we pulled in 2.2%. In August, we pulled in a 0.8% return, being caught off guard with the tariffs escalating after a month before they said we had a deal in the books. And now it's been quite some time. Is the trade war going to escalate? If so, we will be short the SPY in emerging markets using option callers while still owning the assets and we'll be long the TLT and GDX. Today we're in a de-escalating feeling, although hard to buy it. In this setup, this is where you'll see your TLT and GDX sell off a little bit and your SPY in emerging markets goes up. Uh, and this would be the play if we actually got a phase one deal. Uh, for a considerable amount of time. I could see the SPY easily heading up towards uh, 3.30 at a minimum if we get a trade deal, plus we continue to have the dovish Fed that's doing quantitative easing. And if it's up in the air, we're long all three assets with a tight option caller on GDX. So we're able to uh, rotate as we get the narrative from these leaders. Here's your bullish trade. If we're in a bullish loose option caller, your options will lose money. The underlying asset delivers the profit. We're selling an out of the money call and using it to purchase an out of the money put. This way, if something wrong happens, uh, we have uh, downside protection. We're giving up some profit to have free downside protection. This is the trade we're in right now on the SPY. A tight option caller will typically sell an at the money call and then buy a near the money put. This gives us less potential to benefit from the asset going higher, uh, but we can get a nice healthy profit if it just goes flat. And the bearish inverted option caller takes advantage of owning the asset, selling an in the money call, and then purchasing an in the money put. This is the safest way to bet down on an asset and uh, generate consistent returns. So this is a setup uh, that we were in from uh, Monday through Wednesday on the SPY. We were at maximum profit until the last seconds before we had to issue the trade today. So uh, we will have a lot of profits to be made with this setup when the time comes. Our simple 4 ETF portfolio is extremely diversified and all you'll need for your retirement. Income and safety, not growth or speculation. Simplify your holdings, reduce your risk, get better results with less work, and weatherproof your retirement portfolio. Call Dean now to lock in your discount and a free month in our $10,000 boot camp when you upgrade your free trial today. Call him now at 505-322-7515. Hope everybody enjoyed today's presentation. Tomorrow we have a live webinar where I will preview some of the boot camp content looking at the big picture. We'll go through the last century of U.S. history, especially in terms of inflation and monetary policy and look at how we can strip out all the noise out there really focus on what the central bank is doing and be able to predict the stock and bond market in terms of the big moves accurately and that's how our strategy works that's how we're able to generate safe returns with low risk
So call Dean. Let's get you set up. 505-322-7515. Here's our disclaimer. Go ahead and feel free to pause it, visit that link, and don't forget to show up to our webinar tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, one hour before you'll get the access link in your email. And the presentation can typically go for about an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Uh, people love it. They ask us a ton of questions. It's very interactive. It's not a sales pitch. You'll learn a lot and you'll understand how our program works in detail. So thank you a lot and we'll see you tomorrow.